So I saw this notice about an art show taking place in the next town. So it was on the weekend and I needed to see some art. I've been locked away here doing design and gardening and doing this, all this other shit in the, at the uh, design studio here in Thousand Islands, Ontario. And I needed to see some art. So I went and it was in a Canadian legion. And a Canadian legion, for those of you not in Canada, is kind of like a community event, a hall thing in in small towns across Canada where people can, I guess they rent them out for different events. Uh, a lot of times there's art shows or bingo or, or sales or... Uh, the legions are great spaces for this kind of thing. So anyway, this is where the art show uh, was going to be. So I went. As you would expect in a small town, the art was kind of varied uh, and different. It it was um, and, uh, it was mostly Bob Rossi kind of art. You know, like there was some excellent watercolors. There was some realistic stuff. And it was all sort of, it was all good. It was all great. And most of the artists were like, um, I guess, seniors, uh, women. They they were, you know, sitting in front of their, their displays, which were on the walls. And uh, I walked in this room and walked around quickly looking at the walls. And then I saw this one painting. This is a show about jewelry. Why we wear it, why it matters, how it's made and what it means. I'm Alex D and I turn cannabis into gold. I make mind blowing jewelry in gold, silver and platinum from cannabis plants here in Canada for stage, screen, for people who wanna rock crazy jewelry. I'm the cannabis goldsmith. It was a watercolor, and it was right in the back corner. And uh, I, it's kind of like a wrought iron lamp against a wall of pink flowers. Uh, or kind of, it's hard to describe, but like, the, you know, ivy growing on a wall, except flowers, and then a lamp. Whatever, it, it's just an image, and it just struck me, and it was well executed. There was a lot of dark and light colors in it and I I liked it and it it was like immediately different from everything else in the room I mean the work was exceptional the quality of work was nicely executed so I thought I wonder who owns this there was nobody sitting in front of this there were other paintings in the in, uh, in that section of the artists wall too but they were nothing like this this was special so I went looking for the artist, and the artist, it turns out the artist was the this elderly kind of woman who had who had welcomed me into the Legion and uh, got me to fill out a form for a raffle ticket for a painting. She was very sweet, and it turns out this was her her work. So I somebody pointed her out, and so I went to her and I said, look, I want to buy your painting. It's beautiful. And she didn't believe me at first, right? And then she sort of, yeah, I mean, he might be serious, right? So I said, come, tell me about it. And uh, she came and she described the painting to me. And I said, look, I want to buy it. And I said, it's the best painting in this space. And she grabbed my hand and looked in, in my eyes like, you understand, don't you? You understand. It was that, it's that moment it's that moment we've all had, even as kids, when we're like drawing a, a picture of like a tree and we show it to our parents and the parent nods and it's like, it's the best thing you, you've done. You, you've captured art, you've made art, you've seen a tree and you've recreated it in, in a crayon and you got this, this recognition for doing it. And all this flashed through uh, when she grabbed my hand and looked into my eyes and said, and, and it was, thank you, and you understand what the value of this work is. Now, the money didn't have to change hands even. Just this, this, this honest recognition of good work. 
And I think that a lot of that's what's lacking in today's society. But any, anyway, that's a whole other topic. But I, I was so happy to get this piece because it's, I didn't even know if I had a wall to hang it on, really. I bought it. It wasn't expensive. I got a good price. It wasn't expensive, but it was priceless because it's a beautiful painting and it's now hanging on my wall and I've made her happy and the work is excellent. And so that's that. Now, I years ago, I wouldn't have even known how to buy a painting. I still don't know how to buy a painting or to buy art. The only way I buy art is if I go into a room and I see something and it draws me in in some way. I can't even describe it half the time. It's like, okay, uh, let's see if I can buy that. And I may, maybe I can find a place to put it on my wall. That's how I buy art. Everyone buys art in a different way. So, But anyway, today's podcast <laughs> is about gemstones. This is Gemstones 101. You hear, you hear all this? They're, I'm on the St. Lawrence Seaway, and the seaway is open now, and you'll hear boats... Uh, you'll hear ships, like if some some guy in a kayak is like in the way, you'll hear this massive foghorn as they try and blow the guy out of the water with the with the foghorn. Anyway, so today's episode is about gemstones, gemstones 101. We're not going to go into detail on them, but we're just going to go overall a kind of uh, an overview on gemstones and, and sort of what the thinking is about gemstones and and maybe how to think about them so as not to get too freaked out when you're buying jewelry or whatever. Also, I'm going to provide you with a list of two books uh, that are pretty good. Uh, the the one is a very small book. It's it's more it's more science. The one book is a more sciency, and the other book is more kind of spirity, because a lot of people believe gemstones have spiritual aspects. So I'll give you both sides of the story there. But anyway, let's go to gemstones. What are what what the hell are gemstones? For a jeweler, a gemstone is something is a is a type of stone or material. Uh, they can be organic too, so it doesn't have to be stone. It can be an organic material, I think. But generally speaking, a uh, gemstone is a type of mer- mineral that is used in making jewelry. The organic ones I talk about are like ivory, um, stuff like that. That is not necessarily a, a gemstone, but it can be considered if it's polished and set in in jewelry. But today we're just going to be talking about stones. How did people figure out gemstones? If you imagine, if you've ever been on vacation, if you've ever been to a beach, or even if you haven't been to the seashore, if you've been to a lake bed, a lake, a river, where there's a pebble beach on the side, or a lake, and you're walking along this this lake at the shoreline where the water is sort of wetting the stones on the shore, and you look down and you see a clear stone. It might catch your attention. Like these days, it would be a piece of glass that's maybe been rounded by the by the river, the lake, or the ocean, been polished by the sand, and it's it's wet a little bit, so it's shiny like it's polished. And this catches your attention, and you pick it up and look at it closer. And if you hold it up to the light and you can see through it like glass, then you understand how people first understood about gemstones and what they could do. So somebody saw a stone that had been polished by the environment, by a river or by sand or water, weather, and shined it up a bit. And they found it and picked it up and hold it up to the sun and looked through it. And bam, gemstones were born. So it was only a matter of time before they appeared in rings and hanging around necks and on bracelets and sewn into clothing and and, and drilled into teeth and, and all this kind of stuff because they're really amazing. They're beautiful. Now, jewelers... I, again, we're going to separate the softer ivory carvable stuff out. Um, gemstones tend to be hard harder than other stones there's a scale of hardness that is used in 
in by gemologists and by mineral people. It's the it's a scale of hardness, and it goes from one to ten. And at the bottom are really, really soft materials like talc. They're like soap. You can scratch them with your fingernail. That that's it's a natural material. Um, it's a rock. It's a mineral. But you, it's so soft you can scratch it with your fingernail. And at the top, number 10, is diamond. And this is the hardest substance on this scale. The hardest substance can scratch the substance below it all the way down to the very bottom one. And then there are, there are some kind of midpoint areas. Like number 7 is quartz. And quartz can scratch glass, window glass, right? There are different things that scratch other things. And this hardness scale is based on scratching, on the, one, the, the ability of one material to scratch another. Okay, so I'm not going to get any more technical than that right now. I'm not going to get any more technical than that right now. For jewelry, you want something, you want a gemstone that's going to be hard. You don't want it scratching. Because what happens is when you polish something, just like in metal, it's a series of scratches. So you start, say you get a piece of uh, uh, gemstone just a, that you found on the beach. And you want to make it really highly polished. What you do is you have to sand it down, like uh, grind it down, take off the pointy parts, just like the river has done or the sea has done, and made, uh, made it sort of round in shape and uh, taken off the sharp bits. And then you use a finer grit and a finer grit and a finer grit until you can't see those scratches anymore. And it, it appears that it develops a very, very high a very high polish, a shine, all on its own. It doesn't have to be wet. It holds that shine. But if the material is soft in daily life when you're wearing this gemstone, it'll scratch, and it'll take away that, that shine, that highly polished shine that's required to make the gemstone sparkle and look like it's wet with water on the beach. The thing that attracts you to pick it up. The thing that that focuses your attention. For jewelers, we look at stones that are hard. Unless we have a, a purpose. I'll describe that too in a minute. I'm working on a piece now for hopefully for next year's Grammy Awards. Somebody's going to wear it. And I'm using a soft material in it. But um, but for gemstone, gemstones for jewelers, generally speaking, we want gemstones that are hard, that can take daily abuse in a ring to get beaten up and knocked around. Say, if, you know, you're if if you're you're out, you, God, daily life is hard on on us, right? But it's brutal in jewelry, so you want a stone that can deal with that. As things went, um, diamonds are the hardest. So how do they? How do they? If, if if this is all based on scratch, how do they polish diamonds? How do they polish diamonds because they're so hard? Well, they we polish them with other diamonds. You, you, you grind up diamonds to dust at different different coarse, medium, fine, super fine, like mega super fine, and this is how you cut diamonds and polish diamonds with other diamonds, right? And you can use diamonds to polish the next stone down on the hardness scale, which is corundum. Now you probably never heard of corundum. Don't worry about it. Corundum is rubies and sapphires. Those are corundum. When you hear somebody saying, oh, it's corundum, it's rubies and sapphires. Rubies are red corundum, and sapphires are every other color of corundum. So sapphires can be blue, green, clear like diamonds. Uh, but rubies can only be red and versions of red. But they're both corundum, and they're very hard. They're slightly less hard than diamonds, but they're hard. They're really hard stones. So they're good to wear in jewelry. 
sapphires, rubies can hold their polish because they're really hard. Uh, that's why they became popular in jewelry. Also because the colors are truly outstanding, especially with sapphires. The colors are amazing. The thing is about gemstones, you want hard gemstones. You want them in the upper end of this hardness scale. Above quartz is usually good. Less expensive jewelry, you can go crazy. You can use different types of quartz, for example. Quartz comes in all kinds of colors. It doesn't, it, it'll get dinged. And as you wear it every day, it won't hold that polish that, that you need to give it that gumdrops, sparkly on the beach kind of appearance. Okay, cutting, cutting, gem cutting. Remember, this is, I'm not getting into detail here. This is just kind of an overview about gemstones. Uh, cutting. There are two general types of gemstone cuts. There's cabochons, cabs, which is a, a sort of a smooth, polished cut. Think of a think of a um, a sphere. Think of a ball, a soccer ball, a basketball. Think of a a gemstone shaped like half of a basketball, but polished on the surface, really shiny. That's a cab. That's a cabochon, and it can be flat and polished, or it can be rounded and polished, or it can be an odd shape and polished. Now the other type of cut is faceted cuts, and faceted are are have square, have flat surfaces. And what they do is they take a cabochon uh, shape, and then they start adding facets to it, like flat surfaces. And the flat surfaces enhance the way the light passes through the gemstone. Now generally they don't facet murky gemstones or opaque gemstones. Gemstones you can't see through. They don't generally facet, although some people do because it's a look, right, that they want. But generally people facet clear gemstones and they use the potential of the facet to enhance the sparkle of the material of the gemstone. Gemstones have optical properties just like eyeglasses, they change the way light enters and leaves them. By angling the facet or the flat cut in a certain angle, you can increase or diminish the amount of light coming out of the stone. Now, this is where diamond cutting comes into play, or it, it seems, in, you know, Jewel, we complicate all this shit. There are two kinds of people who cut gemstones. There's the lapidary people who cut every other gemstone except diamonds. And then there's the diamond cutters who cut diamonds. Okay. It's all generally considered lapidary. But don't worry about any of that shit. So you have a clear hunk of rock say it's a diamond you have a clear hunk of rock it looks like a broken piece of glass in your hand it looks great but you can't really set this in a in a ring right or on a, a in a say let's go big here say you're a king you want to put it in your crown you could just stick this thing in there and it would look okay it look look okay i guess but to really bring out the fire of this material, you cut, put flat, polished areas on it in a certain configuration, and it harnesses the optical properties of the stone itself to magnify the fire coming out of it, the visual spark coming out of it. Now, this is what a diamond cutter a good diamond cutter can do with a good diamond. And with a bad diamond, they can make it better by, by working with what's there to enhance the better parts while subduing the not so good parts on an expensive stone. All this kind of stuff is not done on, on 
small stones. It's, it's done on big stones. And by big stones in the way of diamonds, I mean two carats and above, probably now three carats and above. I'll get into that in the diamond show. Right now, we're looking at putting facets on a kind of a chunk of rock to enhance its, its beauty to go in the crown of the king or on a ring or something. When facets are added to transparent, to clear uh, gemstones, it enhances the value. So the cutting can enhance the value of a gemstone. And in fact, it's one of the key components of price in gemstones is the cutting. You want to cut that enhances the material. So what's better, a cab, cabochon cut or faceted cut? There's no better. It depends on what stone you're using and what purpose you want to use it for. You can mix and match too. I mean, a good cab, cabochon, a good cab cut on a trans completely clear stone, they look like gumdrops, right? They're just beautiful, beautiful, like like drops of colored water. Like the, if you get a sapphire, for example, or a ruby that's, that's clear and that's cut like that, they can be incredible. And then you can get these other things that happen. You get star sapphires where the cut in the, the polish on the stone enhances an optical characteristic that produces a star. So you get these star sapphires. Um, the, the star appears when you move the, the stone around in the light, it'll, it'll move around the stone. And a cat's eye effect is also similar to this. So, so somebody who's cutting gemstones is, is sort of aware of all this shit. Now, what does this, what does this mean for you? Well, it means that there, there are all kinds of options and, and really too many to consider when you're buying stones, gemstones. Just like me going to that art show earlier on, I think that's how, that's the best way to buy gemstones. Look, don't buy a gemstone because it's trendy. Buy it because it makes you feel something. All right? Like that painting, it made me feel something. So I bought it, and it wasn't expensive. And to, to be honest, if it was, you know, $100 more, I might not have bought it, but I probably would have bought it because it's just beautiful. But I was drawn to it. If you're thinking about gemstones, don't buy a gemstone because someone else says it's good. Buy it because you want to buy it, and buy it because it makes you feel something. So that's what I'm saying about gemstones. Now, there's a whole other thing about gemstones where people wear gemstones because they have this sort of amulet or talismanic quality, this kind of good luck charm quality. Uh, and in fact, a lot of stones are built into charms. We talked about charms a couple of episodes ago, but gemstones play a part in that too. There, there are people who believe that gemstones have certain spiritual powers, enhancing powers, or things like that. Now, I'm not going to discount any of that. And in fact, good, good for the people who believe that. I might even believe that a little bit to a degree um, with some materials that I wear. So I'm not going to I'm not going to be critical of that, especially because it can enhance the meaning of jewelry, right? I don't care. Like, if somebody buys something because they like the blue color of a particular gemstone, um, it just makes them feel like that that day they were at the ocean when they were a kid, right? Or if somebody buys it because it, it, of the protective qualities of the stone, it really doesn't matter to me. It's beauty in different language is, is all that is, in my opinion. There's a book. There's a book I'm going to, um, the best book about the spiritual aspects of this, where it's like a huge directory. It, it was uh, created by this woman, Melody, she called herself. It's like an encyclopedia of the meaning, the spiritual meaning of gemstones. And um, I know there's many books like this out there, but that's that, that's the one I have on my shelf. And if if someone comes to me um, as a designer, as a 
as a jewelry designer, um, we're working on a piece together, and they want to incorporate stones in it because they're spiritual. They have a spiritual aspect. I'm all over it, man. I have this melody book on the shelf. I'm going to go deep into it. I'm going to find out everything I can about the materials that uh, that are going to go into the piece and maybe offer advice as to other materials that could be better, stuff like that. This is how I make I custom jewelry for our clients. Like, you know, I... <laughs> This I'll list the book in the show notes. There's two books. There's one book. Uh, the book by Melody is that spiritual book about gemstones. And the other book, the more sciencey one, is called Gemstones of the World. It's newly revised and expanded. It's probably in, in the, the one I am holding in my hand is the third edition, but it's probably more editions past that. So Gemstones of the World by Walter Schumann, uh, S-C-H-U. M-A-N-N. It's a small hardcover book. It's filled with excellent pictures and data about different gemstones uh, of the world. It shows you where they come from, how hard they are. It gives you uh, pictures of what they look like when they're cut, which is important. So if you, if you're even interested in the least in gemstones, get that book. And if you're interested in the the spirituality of gemstones, get Melody's book because it's it's just the work involved in it. So back to gemstones. Which gemstones are better? All of them are better, and all of them have different purposes. Now everything has caveats. Like I said before. Jewelers, we tend to we tend to veer towards the stones that are harder because they wear better, and that's those are the top sort of. The top ones are diamond, corundums, uh, emerald, which is a little less hard than the sapphires and the rubies, the corundums. It's a little less hard, um, but it's still plenty hard. But therein is a problem. Hardness is not the only thing we have to consider. Have you ever dropped like a glass on on your counter at home and the thing shattered into a million pieces? Like you, it didn't shatter into two pieces, right? It shattered into like a million pieces of sharp little objects everywhere. Gemstones can shatter too. And they shatter along along areas within them called cleavages and you know i it, emerald emerald is kind of emerald is so beautiful that beautiful green stone it's hard but it it it's has all these points in it where it can break right it's so it's fragile it's a fragile stone so a stone can be really hard but it can also be fragile too so jewelers have to consider all these things when we're making a piece, right? With me, uh, for example, this piece I'm trying to make for next year's Grammys. I'm like, okay, I want to make a music-themed piece for next year's Grammys. I, I don't know yet who's going to wear this piece, but somebody is going to. And I want to use a gemstone, a Canadian gemstone, but I need to use an opaque gemstone in it because the design calls for a white colored gemstone that is opaque that you can't see through this white colored gemstone I'm, I'm trying to figure out what I can use for this and I've gone through a whole a whole mess of different I could use a kind of a milky quartz that has a hardness of seven uh, for this piece it, it's too common right it's all you can you can find this stuff in your in your garden, right? I, I don't want to use that. I want something more exotic and more different. So I'm looking at organic materials, like maybe a fossilized narwhal tusk or something absolutely bizarre, which is also a gemstone if we make it a gemstone. So if I can get some fossilized, like, tusk from a Canadian, some kind of Canadian animal that's white in color, because I need the white in color in the design, right? And that's hard. Like a, these, these petrified wood type fossilized things are, are not the hardest things in the world, but they, some of them do take a polish I've seen. So, 
See, these are all the things we worry about when we're when we're jewelry designers and we're 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 trying to take a new direction. Back to you guys. And enough about me and my my wacky Grammys. Okay, this this is not affiliated the Grammys in any way. So that's the disclaimer here. Uh, gemstones. It does it doesn't have to be the most expensive gemstone either. Uh, the gemstone spectrum is wide, and it can be you can buy gemstones because of their color, because of 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 their value, because of what they make you feel like when you see them. And I suggest that you not buy gemstones because someone tells you to buy them, even me, but I suggest you buy them because they make you feel good. And if, if you like blue, the color blue, if, if, if you like the certain purpley blue and, and, and you see tanzanite and that's the color, that's your favorite color, buy something with tanzanite. But research it first before you do. We might even do a whole show on tanzanite. That's, well, I hope to break down some of the different gemstones individually and go over them. We're definitely going to do a show on diamonds. And we're going to do a show, probably do a show on corundum. And, um, and other, maybe we'll do a show on diamonds and then a show on colored gemstones, which are all the other gemstones except for diamonds. Uh, I hope that's sort of given you a general direction on gemstones. But don't listen to me. Do your own research. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, Get the, get the Gemstones of the World book. Have it on your bookshelf. It's a good, or have it on your coffee table even. It's a small, if you have a small coffee table, it's a tiny, tiny book. Uh, but it's hardcover, very good looking book, excellent photography, good information. And Melody's book, if you, if you are a believer in the spirituality of Gemstones, you need to Melody's book because it's it's the Bible of this shit, and uh, that's on the shelf also. And with us, I mean, I incorporate gemstones into our products. Everything from diamonds, the very the very highest quality Canadian diamonds, the best diamonds you can get in the on the planet, to to this organic material. I'm trying to figure out for this uh, for this piece. I'm trying to make for the award show next year. I'll let you know how that goes. Ah, gemstones, like little drops of joy. The Cannabis Goldsmith is produced by Tribe Communications, Inc. in the Thousand Islands area of Ontario, Canada. Visit our website at tribe.ca to see what we do. Send me an email, alexd at cannabisgoldsmith.com. Or you can follow us on Instagram. I don't post a lot there, but our Instagram account is at T-R-I-B-E-D-O-T-C-A. See you next week on The Cannabis Goldsmith.